Becky Wasserman, Legislative Council. Um, this draft 1.3 of H209 is the amendment that your committee had put together um, that has uh, a needs assessment survey um, as well as um, <clears throat> looking for uh, a funding source, I guess, yeah. for, for um, funding school construction projects. Um, House institutions had put together a proposal. I don't, I don't, I can't speak to whether it's finalized in their mind. Um, I don't know if you want to. Where they are. Yeah, yeah. Do you want me to just describe it, or I, I don't know if you want to see the language. Okay. But Maybe I can find it on their on their. Um, yes, it was yesterday's mm -hmm. two oh nine one. And we do understand that this is not something the committee has voted on. This is just where they right. are at this point in time. Is this the 8.02 p.m.? This, this is from, it just is not an amendment because they don't have, uh, they don't have jurisdiction of the bill. So it just was drafted as, as a proposal for 209. Um, so in in their proposal um, section one is first looking at the Vermont construction planning guide which was the last one was published in 2008 um, when it was the Department of Education and that set forth the, the process for the school construction um, program really like how schools would apply for a grant and it also had um, the the capital outlay formula in there for how, um, like the <coughs> costs were, what how to figure out eligible costs, square footage, and and those sort of things that went into the award that a school would received would receive. So section one of their proposal is asking the secretary of education um, to consult with the executive director of the Vermont Superintendents Association and the, the chair of the State Board of Education and the Commissioner of Buildings and General Services to update that uh, construction planning guide by January 15th of next year. And the guide shall reflect modern educational requirements and opportunities. Um, any questions on that? Then section two uh, is looking to have a school facilities conditions analysis. Um, so this again would be done by the Secretary of Education but in, com in coordination with BGS. Um, and I think the idea there was that BGS does um, facilities conditions analysis for state buildings. And so they would be able to provide some guidance on how to do that for schools statewide. Um, so last year, I didn't have much interest in being involved at all. Have they picked up some steam? Um, I, I think uh, there, there, were, there were folks from BGS there who, who offered to provide air resistance. Yeah. Yeah. He was positive. He, was, he seemed positive. He, <laughs> he always seems positive, though. <laughs> um, <laughs> So they would be looking to develop a plan for a school facilities condition analysis to inform AOE of the um, statewide school facilities needs and costs. And it, this analysis would look at a review of both school facilities conditions and space needs. And this, this subsection B is a little different from the amendment that um, the, the last draft of the amendment in here where it has the Secretary of Education contracting with an independent third party to conduct the analysis <coughs> rather than having it internal to AOE. And then there's still the amount of 1.5 million appropriated for the analysis, although I, I hear there's been some discussion we'll, of general funds versus another source yeah, of yeah. funds for that. So we'll, we'll address that one now. And then section three, is sort of similar to what was in um, this committee's amendment with respect to trying to figure out how to fund projects. Um, so this has uh, the treasurer and the direct executive director of the bond bank by December 15th, 2023. And I, I should mention that the conditions analysis, um, the idea was to have that completed by June of 2023. So after that's done, the treasurer and the bond bank would, <coughs> 
by six months later, submit a report to the House um, in Corrections and Institutions and Education Committees and the Senate Education and Institutions Committees of an analysis of the, the challenges and opportunities to the state, if any, of funding school construction projects, and then recommendations for a funding source for school construction projects that are linked to the inventory needs and conditions of all Vermont schools. Treasurer was there. <laughs> uh, the treasurer was not there yesterday. I, I do think there there had been some discussions with her uh, about this language. Yeah. And it's still still looking at, at bonding, and whereas I think we were trying to think of other opportunities, other funding options. Um, so the language isn't specific yeah. to bonding. Um, yeah. I guess it, you know it's. I think recommendations for a funding source could be pretty broad. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Questions? Yeah. yeah. Um, do you mind going back up to the sure. facilities analysis? Mm -hmm. I just wanted to make sure. So, first we develop a plan for conducting the conditions analysis. And then you contract with the third party to conduct the actual analysis. Right. Okay, so we have the info by 2023. So uh, uh, one thing the committee did talk about yesterday was that I think this language needed to be clarified that the analysis would be done by 2023. Okay, so um, that's what I was confused about. Right. I think like when we actually do the analysis. Right, so the plan, the plan is really, I think, developing an RFP to be able to go out gotcha. um, to do the analysis with the with the goal of having that completed by 2023. Okay, and on the next page, and then that's my only question. Um, the only thing I'm missing here, and maybe this is just beyond the scope of what the, because I know the treasurer and we heard testimony didn't seem super excited about no. leading this project. Um, I, uh, one of the things, though, that I don't see here is I, I do see that recommendations for a funding source could include many things beyond bonding, so that's mm -hmm. good. I had been kind of interested in how other states are funding, funding school construction projects. We had that in our draft. Yeah, so Would that be just sort of built into to this <coughs> section? or It's not necessarily built in. I think if you wanted to look at that, the language would need to include that. Because the work group had started to do some of that work and I thought it was so interesting. So Colorado so uses cannabis and yeah. uh, Massachusetts uses the sales tax. And right. Yeah. yeah, so I just, I, I'm sorry to see that go. Maybe that so doesn't have to go. We, but that, we have the bill. We have, we own this yeah. bill right now. So, so we haven't started our markup on that. We did ask them to and in our discussion with the chair is to start looking at um, really what we would include in the survey and to use some of their expertise for that. Mm -hmm. But we do need to follow up with our sections of the bill and that would of course be one that we have some interest in. Okay. We also have some interest in, in the money um, on that as well. Yeah. Um, on page two lines, uh, two through five, the Secretary of Education um, and consultation shall develop a school capital. So, within that wording, does that mean that the Secretary of Education can look also like at uh, kind of prioritize schools with the highest needs yeah. in terms of safety, you know, addressing safety, or you know, kind of have some kind of weighting system as to you what know, schools? Are you I, on the I'm so sorry, but I just realized that we have a time limit for the secretary here who has to oh, be somewhere okay. at 11.30. I'm sorry. So if we, yep. can, we can do, do I'm that. I'm just wondering if you have a quick answer. Or if that's in rules. So I just or, didn't know which section you're talking about. Okay. Section well, 1 or section let's, 2? Let's, let's, I was going to say, three, you're getting ahead of it. This is only to do the assessment. This is not about awarding. Or making a deciding. Making priority, yeah. 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 In fact, there's nothing in here about yeah. one next. Unscheduled meeting institutions. Yeah. I think uh, right. Chair Carroll's supposed to be scheduled to testify. I'm not scheduled to testify here. Oh, you're not. So I'm just so interested so for listening. Just okay. interested. So, so let's get you, because you're, are you going next door as well? <coughs> I'm, I'm available to you as you wish. Okay, great. Um, why don't we put 
I'm done. That's our time. Yeah. Oh, I think what Sarita was pointing yeah. out, which yeah. is also, you know, yeah. as you say, it's our bill. We need to add to it because there's no what's next. Mm -hmm. We this. we haven't marked. We haven't even. Yeah. All we have is the first draft. They've been right. working on on the um, survey, and now we need to take up. Yes, right, so I guess I would add to that that this is contemplating that the treasurer would come back with a funding source by the end of 2023. So then in the legislative session in 2024, I guess that's when the legislature could decide to, you know, figure out what the program will look like based on what the funding is and what the needs are um, of, in the schools. Okay. And who Thank knows, you. maybe that federal funding will come through. Yes. Um, so we should um, get you back to start um, looking at our section of the bill. We know, for example, that um, it needs to. It was, I think, the n number was changed to 1.3 million, okay. and and it, it needs to come from the general fund. From the uh, maybe from the Ed fund. Okay. It was 1.5, it was recommended that it could be 1.3. After um, Jan Lowe looked at that. Um, and who do you think that we need to hear from? Um, maybe the treasurer and the bond bank, yeah. um, if they're being tasked with looking at funding. Um, we did have the bond bank talk to us about the current state of affairs, <coughs> but we haven't had the treasurer back. I'm sure that she has. It. The other, I guess, the interest would be other other models besides using the treasurer. Um, another, another person that we could task for that. I can't. When we did water quality, that was the treasurer's office. That was the treasurer's office, mm -hmm. and as she said, she wasn't in the room. I was in the room when we selected her, <laughs> and here I am again. Um, but. Uh, I don't know if there's another, and she's doing a good job. Um, but uh, I can't think of anybody else that could. could well, if, if there's someone else looking at what other states are doing, um, <coughs> that could inform the conversation too. I think it would be helpful to do that early. Um, and BGS would also be helpful to hear from in terms of. I mean, if you call it a needs assessment or facilities condition analysis, I think they could give some background on what that process looks like. Um, they spoke in house institutions about how they had just done an RFP for the state buildings. So <coughs> they, they do have a lot of the information, like sort of recently done, that they could help provide for schools. Okay. Avery, let's see if we can get BGS and the treasurer to talk with us again. Okay, thank you. Well, I, I have oh. a question. Did, um, did you get a sense from over there, I mean, the level to which the, of what is being asked of the state treasurer, I mean, with, with water quality, with like your task with turning over every rock and behind every corner for money, whereas I'm not sure that this is necessarily saying the same thing. This is more. Um, so I, I'm hesitant to, I guess, characterize, characterize it, but I guess I sort of heard through the grapevine <laughs> that the treasurer's office was the one that said they were comfortable with what is there, but I think that you should definitely hear from her yeah. to, to convert that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Which will help me um, organize a question to the chair of the state board. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Of the committee. Pleasure to see you. My name is John Carroll, for the record. I'm chair of the State Board of Education. Uh, I guess a, a couple, I did sit in on the discussion yesterday in institutions and uh, heard the discussion of, of their draft as, as well as yours. I, I guess my perspective would be to say that uh, the 
you're trying to get your arms around two things, I think. One is what might be involved for costs? Given, given the status of our schools today, what might be involved for costs, big number, uh, to bring them up to standard or expectations? And then the other piece of it is uh, where would the money come from? Two totally separate questions, equally important. And, and the ans answers to those questions ought to come on stream about the same time. And that's uh, what uh, I think it's the institution's proposal brings the answer to the first question, what might it all cost, on stream around mid-year 2023, and then the proposal about, and how would you go pay for it, would come on stream at the end of 2023, six months later. And that's understandable, because you, you, you need to sort of dimension how big is this problem in order to make some recommendations about how you go about paying for it. So all of that seems to make uh, sort of harmonious sense. I just would observe that in your current draft, so let, let, let me, I want to just talk about the, the, how big is the problem. So you answer that by doing a systematic assessment or evaluation of existing facilities uh, and their adequacy to meet their current purposes or projected purposes. Uh, and that's, that, that's what your assessment proposes to do. The difference between your proposal and the institutions is the institutions proposes that that be conducted by an independent expert, presumably an architectural engineering firm that's been retained for that purpose. Whereas your proposal looks like it's a self-reporting survey. The language in your draft says something about a plan for distributing and maximizing response rates to the survey. Um, my per personal counsel on this would be, and I think the State Board would concur, and I suspect the Secretary himself would concur, that just asking the school districts to tell you what their needs are is not exactly a rigorous process. Um, and um, so something like what the institutions folks have drafted by way of, of um, retaining uh, outside experts to go in and evaluate these facilities is probably the way to go. Whether it costs 1.3 or 1.5, um, I used to be in the construction business, but I, I can't possibly tell you what that means. Except I would say that if it's 1.5, that's about 50 to 100 thousand dollars per school, per facility to visit. So you can think about that a little bit and say, well, how many do we have to visit? Well, probably all of them. And uh, what should that cost us? to have some, a team of architects and engineers or other qualified professionals visit each building, probably spend three or four days there, maybe longer, write up an analysis and a report. You gotta do that 200 odd times to cover all the schools in the state. Um, maybe more, I don't know, I, I, I mean, it may be understating the size of it. But in any case, it's a big project. It could be that, in fact, it might be wise to divvy that up among several contractors so that you're not dependent, as was the state of Iowa, on one contractor who just didn't have what it takes. Uh, I, I would say that in order to do this systematic engineering architectural assessment, you, you need a couple things before you start. And there's provision in here for making a plan for the RFP, as uh, was just mentioned. Uh, if you, to do an assessment, it's against, you're comparing the existing school that you're visiting with a team of engineers and architects to what? So what is the what that you want them to be using as a frame of reference? And I would submit to you that there are maybe three things. One is simply modern building specifications. An example is that when many of these schools were built, they probably had insulation in their walls equivalent, equivalent to an R12. That was 30 years ago. Today, our 50 or 60 is probably a desirable standard. Uh, they might have had air changes in the gymnasium of three per hour. Today, you'd probably say, for health reasons, it ought to be six per hour. I'm not an expert on those things, but I know enough to know what I don't know. And so you need to update your standards. The easy way to do that, of course, is just to ask BGS. What are the building standards the state is employing when it funds any new building for state purposes. Probably that ought to be the standards you would use. 
I'm not talking about how big is the room. I'm talking about how it is constructed. The second piece is how big is the room. And that is, BGS can't tell you that. But your own, the existing documents you have, in particular the capital outlay financing formula, stipulates that you have to have 30 square feet in the music <coughs> room for every child who will be in there, whatever the numbers are. And for all the different activities in, in a school, there are standards for, for, for such facilities in terms of their size and capacity. So the first piece is a sort of specifications analysis, the building specifications. The second piece is the school or facility standards. The, the, the document called Capital Outlay Financing Formula basically says these are the standards that you have to meet in order to receive state money. Um, the premise here is that there will be some state money involved. So those standards need to be updated. Maybe many of them are still perfectly appropriate, but I'll bet you there's no good standard in there for, about, for a computer lab, for example. Because these things are, what, 2006, the last time they were updated? 2008, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't have Seven. that on then. So, so who updates those standards? Um, the work on that, uh, under law, I'm sorry, under rule, the, the, uh, the document called Capital Outlay Financing Formula is adopted by and updated by the State Board of Education. But in... And the State Board has some experience. There are four members of the State Board are former legislators, like you might be someday. Uh, and and um, there's a couple decades of construction experience on the State Board, as it happens. Um, but uh, obviously, this would be a collaboration between the agency and the State Board uh, to adopt uh, updated facility standards, if you will. How big do the rooms need to be, and so on. That's not rocket science, but it, it would take a little time, and it needs to be done before you let a contract to an independent contract to do, uh, engineers and architects, because they need to measure the, the music room and say, well, how many kids do you have in here? 28? Well, this isn't big enough. You need to use that standard. The, the third piece that probably would be very useful to have developed, or updated, if you will, is the the, doc, the document called System for Rating Proposed School Construction Projects. And basically, it, it asks, uh, is this facility adequate, or is it, is it ideal? Is it less than ideal? Is it marginal? Is it inadequate? And it would seem that while you're at it, it would be very useful to have the architects and engineers characterize the school facilities they're examining in those terms. Um, and, and, and again, that is a piece of, of the State Board rule that can be updated comparatively easily by the rule in consultation with the agency. And presumably, um, uh, in, in both sets of updates, we would ask experts in the field. Uh, there are federal standards about uh, room sizes and stuff like that. We certainly need to be mindful of that. Um, so there are a lot of sources to draw upon, but the actual work of it falls to the state board and to the agency, I think. It sounds like a bit of work, and it would be good to get it done before you let a contract to an architectural engineering firm. So they have that as a, as a framework in which, by which to evaluate all these schools. Um, that sounds like a lot of work. It probably is, but it's not, um, it's not as bad as it could be. <laughs> uh, it, it could be that you had to change the rules. And rule changing is a laborious process dictated by 3 VSA Chapter 25, the Administrative Procedures Act. Minimally takes eight months. Mm, typically takes 12 months. We've just been working on the Act 173 rules, which you were all kind enough to say that the State Board should adopt, and therefore we've been the ones who've been overseeing the process of drafting them. And that's been about a 15-month process. And just two weeks, last week, we got to the final draft and started the ICAR process. So in eight months, it'll be done. Uh, it'll be a total of 
15, 16, 17 months. We don't have to do that here, so far as I know. And, and until you come up with some significant changes in the way the capital aid, uh, school aid system works, is the, the, I don't foresee any needs to change the underlying rules, the so-called Rule 6000. Um, Finally, I guess I would comment that in the, in the um, I think it's the, I'm, I'm a little, I'm losing track of which draft I'm talking about. But We've done nothing to our first draft. Yeah, okay, I see your first draft. And I, I and so I think it's in the, in the institution's uh, draft. They say that the guidebook, the Vermont School Construction Planning Guide, should be updated immediately. And I actually would submit to you that that is not a pressing concern because the guidebook itself, although it, it, although it has attached as appendices the capital outlay formula, it's not actually <coughs> part of the guidebook. It's attached, it's relevant, it's needed, but it's not actually part of the guidebook. Similarly, the system for rating proposed schools, which I've discussed to, with you, that too is attached as an appendix, but it's not part of the guide. The guide is not telling you how to build a school. It's not telling you the specifications for the school. It's not telling you how big the music room should be. It's telling you none of those things. It's telling you how to go about applying for state construction aid. There's no doubt that this will need to be updated when you have created a state construction aid program, whatever that might look like. But the bill you have and they have doesn't create a state construction aid program at all. It just starts to lay the, the data groundwork for what might be involved. Our intention is to get the conversation started. Yeah, well, you are. Not to finish it. Yeah, start. yeah. And, and the first chapter is let's just understand how big the problem is and how we might conceivably go about paying for it. This is a guidebook to a school board about the steps you need to go through in order to file all the applications and all of that stuff. So I would just suggest to you that, that the urgency of this is not anything like the urgency of getting started on this uh, field evaluation. Uh, I, I, I do want to be clear that your language suggests that it's a survey that you send out to the schools, and the, those your neighbors are saying, no, 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 we're not going to self-report here. We're going to send out experts and gather the actual money. And that might be worth 1.3 million. <coughs> to send out a survey and collect it, I'll do it for a million if you like. <laughs> so it's you don't need to spend it. So I, I hope that's that, that some interest. Helpful. So we, because we're looking at this as we're getting the conversation started, and knowing that there's a possibility that we can direct things to the board in, yes. in this is very helpful. Um, if you have, it, it, and we, in terms of the fact that we're just getting this started, we've got about a couple of days to work on this <laughs> to bring it to, to bring it to the next stage. Yes. So as a result, we need to be pretty general yep. and move some of the the real work elsewhere. Ta-da! Ta-da! <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and I, I guess I would just say I think the, the House Committee on Institutions made some useful suggestions, yes. and you might roll some of those in. Yeah. And I would just say. Um, I wouldn't worry so much about the urgency of getting this updated. It's it's a process piece that really won't happen until you say, ah, we got a bundle of money, want to apply? And this tells you how to do that. And just another, and I just also want to say that um, Jim is going to come back to do pre-K at 10 of, so just so that we all know that we're, that's when we're going to have the final draft and, and, and vote. Um, is there something in here that that we can make sure we're also addressing 21st century education in, in that, that we're missing in, in what we're doing. We, we did mention that. Because we're talking about, yeah, we've got crumbling schools on one level, but we also have the changing face of education from a teacher directed to student driven, which is changing. Yes, and, and also from um, 
from where geography matters to where geography does not matter. Right. And I think that's a piece that we all could do a better job at kind of thinking what that world could look like. But as we know, there are some online courses that students are taking, which can be very powerful for bringing um, unusual or high-level uh, coursework to schools that couldn't possibly have a staff person to do that because of their size or what have you. So I, I sort of, it, it's a very blue sky thing that I don't feel qualified to offer proposals about, but it would be an area that we ought to understand. That is, how do we create deep connectivity for every school and every child? Well, I'd like to include you in, in working with um, our Ledge Council um, on our draft, because we actually have the bill at this point. Yes. Peter. So uh, the 1.3 million uh, really comes from um, you know an engineering yeah. uh, architecture firm saying it's about eight cents per square foot to do this work, I see. and then a look at how many square feet we have in the state. Yeah. So yeah. it is based on, on sure. um, a firm that, that has done this work previously. And so I guess my question for you is, um, you know, if the RFP goes out to find you know experts in the field to carry out this uh, assessment and they know modern school standards. Yes. Um, is there any need for involvement of rules and the state board in that process? No rules, okay. no rules. It would be useful to either, to get coordinated between what their understanding of standards for how big the music room should be and our document. So we, 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 we just need to have consensus on that. Um, it, I agree with you, good architectural engineering firms will bring tons of, of technical knowledge about school construction standards and good ones will bring a lot of expertise about how big the music room should be for a student. And so I think, I think that um, is something that, that if, for example, we were updating the capital outlay financing formula, the board and the agency together, we ought to be sitting down and talking to Troyes Collins and other ex ex um, uh, folks with expertise in this area, as well as looking at federal standards and um, uh, that, that sort of thing, yeah. And I just to say, um, so the, the school district where I live carried out a, an assessment, I think, very similar to what's being envisioned, yes. um, and it was with Truex Collins yeah. and, and their yeah. engineering firm. Yeah. Um, and it was very much along the lines of, um, you know, what you have, what it would take to bring it up to where it should be, yeah. and then they can even take it a little further and say, you compare it against, quote, a model school. Right. right. And I do think BGS brings a lot of valuable information to yeah. the table. Not that they would do any of the work. Right. No, I think but we have a set of standards as to what are the R values for state, allow acceptable standards for construction of state buildings today. They're real different than they were 30 years ago. And we surely want our schools to be meeting <coughs> all of our state's expectations about school quality of construction. Much. You're most welcome. I appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me here. I hope that's helpful. <laughs> nice. nice to see you again. Thank you. And I know that we have a bill that will likely be coming from the Senate related to the changing nature of the role of the board. If the Lords are smiling upon us, yes. And also, I wanted to share with you that the board has, um, State Board has uh, compiled a report of its inquiry into proficiency based learning. And we'd be very happy to share with you what we learned mm -hmm. and the many questions that, that come out of that. Yes. <laughs> so when the, uh, I'll stand by and we'll, we'll wait for your call to come and share that after when you get to PBL after crossover. <laughs> yeah, right. After crossover. Right. Yeah, it's over there now. It'll be here in due course. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Really Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Four, 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 four
proficiency-based construction. <laughs> 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 You're right. right. Yeah, yeah. I just, I just, I just can't wait to read that bill. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Funded by cannabis. So much cannabis. Twelve point. It's gonna make There it is. Where did I get that money? Okay. All right. So um, we only have a few changes here. Um, <coughs> okay. So we've got new language about Yeah, no, it's good. So we have new language about the uh, responsibility or lack of responsibility of the school district um, for monitoring uh, programs. Uh, uh, Rep. Ravon sat by and he asked me, he suggested a change to this language as well. So this reflects both. Uh, AOE's testimony and uh, Rep. Lalonde's recommendation. Okay, so let me just read it through. It says a school district that pays tuition for pre-K education under this section should be responsible for ensuring that the provider receiving the tuition payment is on the list maintained by the agencies, but uh, but shall have no responsibility to monitor the administration of pre-K educational services on the part of the provider receiving the tuition payment except for services which the district contracts with the provider in order to fulfill its obligations under IDEA. Then it says, a school district paying tuition under this section should be immune from civil and criminal liability for acts or omissions of a public or private provider to which the district pays tuition under this section, except for services which the district contracts with the provider in order to fulfill its obligations under IDEA and except to the extent that it has actual knowledge of a breach by the provider of health or safety rules that apply to the provider's pre-K education program. So if I'm a school employee and I visit the pre-K program and I see something that should be, that I would know would be some kind of a violation? Is it a health and safety violation. Health and safety violation. Yeah. If it's like, okay, Child teacher stopped teaching in 10 hours, but nine hours, that's not. That's not, That's not an issue. But if it's a health and safety issue, <coughs> and you have actual knowledge of it, then you're not protected from being sued. Job in the parking lot. Yeah. Report it. If you know, yeah. yeah. And then we come under the mandated report. Right. So Jay Nichols and Rock Principal Association. So that happens and it gets reported. What then? I'm reading this from a skeptic's lens. I would read it to, to say that I find out there's a violation not me, but somebody about another violation makes the report and then maybe nothing occurs because that's been a concern in the past that, that school districts have asserted. That occurs, the school district is still liable, potentially. We knew about it, we reported it, and nothing was done about it. We can't make anything happen about it because we have no control over the provider, and then the school district could be sued. Am I reading that wrong? Well, it's gonna, the, the facts would be determined by, by a court in that case. So the, is the action you took reasonable under the circumstances, right? So how court would look at that, I think. And they might say that reporting it was sufficient. They might not. It depends on, you know, I can't predict that, but. And fair to say, currently there's no protection. Currently there's no protection. But there's an obligation to monitor. Yeah. So this is going the opposite direction. And uh, Rep. Lalama is thinking there should be a blanket. Uh, and sometimes you do that because because this point here, once you open this up to like some some knowledge standard, they sort of argue about you know. So there are different ways of doing it, but this is the way he re he recommend individually. It was on behalf of this committee at this stage, but yeah. Isn't anybody mandated to report a health or safety issue? DCF has mandated reporters. I'm not sure what DCF requirements are. That'd be Katie could very answer that for you, but I mean, they they're mandated. But they're required under this bill to report, to self-report. They're not meeting the requirements. They have to self-report to their agencies. But also, I would think to DCF because yeah, yeah, so that's their agency. Yeah, yeah. There's no question about reporting. It's a question about liability. 
I, I just thought if you reported as a school employee, that's that's all you have to do. Then it would then be on DC. Uh, uh, as Jim says, it's probably for a court to decide. Yeah. It does open, the, to, to, to Jay's point, it does open up school districts to challenge here, where otherwise it was a blanket, can't challenge, can't sue them. Right. So yeah, it goes a bit in the other direction. On the other hand, if you have actual knowledge that the child is being abused or something over there, you probably should do something about it and not be protected. So, you know, it's that balance. But again, compared to today, this is more limiting. Yeah. 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 More protected. More, yeah. Yeah, you, you can. You, well, can, you can still bring bring something to yeah. someone, regardless of whether you have these protections, correct? Uh, Legally. Without these protections, you can definitely sue. Yeah. With these protections, you can still sue because they could argue you you you, you knew, yeah. right? Uh, so. Okay. Um, then we go to AOE language. Is here. Um, so this is uh, um, saying in proposing and adopting rules under uh, se se Section E, uh, the agency, state board, department, etc., shall seek to ensure the rules that apply to public and private providers are aligned to the extent practicable after taking into account factors that are unique to the public or private provider environment to justify applying different requirements. That was a language. Lastly, we took out um, subsection seven or division seven uh, on your teacher teacher uh, study. So you will see that. Um, okay. So now seven today was eight before. The seven is take it take it out. And those are the only changes. Okay. I'll entertain a discussion. Is there any discussion? I'll entertain a motion. So I shall move that we um, approve and vote um, draft 12.1 as presented. Second. We have a second. Mm -hmm. Discussion? Wait a second. Okay. The clerk shall commence to call the roll. I forgot what to do. We haven't done that this year. Okay. I'm panicking. Nobody gave me any warning. All of a sudden, I'm clerking. Yeah, you people. Okay. Sheesh. Sheesh. All right. Man. Okay. That's cool. That's cool. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Good time. I had like three panics today on different things. Oh. <laughs> it's not, it's not working. Hopefully uh, this isn't one of them. Re <laughs> Representative Conley. Yes. Representative James. Yes. Representative Hooper. Yes. Representative Toof. Yes. Representative Batchelor. Yes. Representative Jim Batista. Yes. Representative Elder. Yes. Representative Austin. Yes. Representative Matos. Yes. Representative Cooperly. Yes. And Chair Webb. Let me think for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. You're welcome.